Good morning. Can we stand? I got to tell you, my favorite part of when Gary's playing piano, and I'm the only one who gets to see this because I'm close enough, is actually watching when the piano shakes. That's when I know that it's really rocking. Um, let's pray as we get ready to, to celebrate this Christmas season together. Lord, we come before you with anticipation. This beautiful moment of Christmas that we celebrate. What a joy it is to come together as a family, to lift up our voices and to praise the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior who has come, who is born on our behalf. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.
fun. It says, go tell it on the mountain. For us, I guess that'd be Mount Diablo. I think it barely qualifies. Think of this as something a little more southern. Go tell it on the mountain. Now's a good time to take some time to greet each other.
mic on is my mic on there's nothing like candy to eliminate that church coffee breath okay all right oh, that's a big step up oh I am so excited to be here with you as you, my lights indicate but now that I've made it up here I think I'll calm them down one notch is it oh, wow we're out of shape I know it's embarrassing. It is. Isn't it nice to, I'm Tiffany Walms, I mean Yates, by the way. Walmsley's my maiden name. You can go either way. And I'm Katie Wybert. Yes, and isn't it nice to see Katie dressed appropriately for her height for a change? I think she looks fantastic. I think so too. So today is so holly and jolly. Don't you love this season? Yes! Woohoo! Yes! Yeah, hey, dangerous. That is dangerous. Today at 3 o'clock, we have our first ever kids fair from 3 to 5. Yes. That's right. Woohoo! It's going to be great. It says kids, but you are all welcome. Just yes. come on out. Bring oh, cookies. <gasps> cookies? Yes, cookies. That's one of the four elf food groups. Well, there you go. Make sure you have your cookies with you. Cookies. So it's going to be lots of fun. We want to invite our Park Mead neighbors, your friends, your family. Just This is going to be a great time to celebrate the birth of Jesus and just have fun. Next, we want to just thank you. Were you not amazed or blown away when you walked in and saw all the gifts by the Christmas giving tree? Woo! Yes, Hillside, you did that. Now, we just have a need. We have a few more gift cards that we need some sponsors for. And so if you don't even have the time to go out and get a gift card, guess what? You can go online and just give. There are certain instructions that you're not going to remember, so I'm not going to say them. But, um, but if you go to the uh, Church Center app or online and you click, click, click give, there will be instructions. I don't know. Where is Sherry? It's good enough. See Sherry if you need yes. uh, instructions for how to do that. Yes, and so now we will calm down one more notch. My lights have stopped blinking. And we are going to discuss our beautiful Christmas Eve services. Hillside will have two services, a 5 o'clock, a little more holly, a little more jolly with children. Yes. They're all welcome. It'll have a little more noise, but it will still Delightful. be a candlelight service. Yes. And then at 11 p.m., your kids should be in bed. <laughs> 
Yes. Because we will then have our last Christmas Eve service, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful service um, with candlelight and choir and everything else. So that's fantastic. But here's the great thing. You're going to wake up Sunday morning. It's going to be Christmas Day, and you get to come back to church. Yes! We are going to have a happy birthday Jesus celebration. So be here at 10 a.m. Bring your friends and your family. Absolutely. We'll celebrate together. Um, for those that are going, uh, or for those that have children as part of the DR, Compassion International, how many of you sponsor children in the DR? Woo! Lots of hands. All right. Well, as part of our annual tradition, those that are going on the trip can bring a gift bag full of just well wishes, little, little trinkets that you can let your child know that you're thinking of them. It does need to fit in a one gallon size Ziploc bag, so that is the only requirement. Um, well, there's some more, but again, you're not gonna remember them, so go <laughs> on to the e-newsletter. The e-newsletter will explain everything and will tell you what you should put in, maybe what you shouldn't, like chocolate, because it melts and it's hot in the DR. So just some things like that. You will need to turn that in, I'm looking at my notes, by January 8th, so you have a little bit of time. But if you're like me and like good deals, now's the time to start getting some of those things, you know, like those stocking stuffers that you can put in the Ziploc bag. And the little kids will just be so excited to receive those. So make sure you start putting that together. Yeah, well, all right, Merry all Christmas. All right, Merry Christmas. Today we light three candles. The first candle is the candle of hope. During Advent, we wait in the hope that God's promises will be fulfilled. The second candle is the candle of peace. We can have peace because God's preparations have brought forth the fulfillment of his promises. Today's candle is the candle of joy. God has given us salvation. Let us rejoice. I will turn their mourning into gladness. I'll give them comfort and joy instead of sorrow. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with joy, filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she explained, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you were bare. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Now may the God of hope fill you with all the joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Part of our worship is the ability to, to give back. We could have our ushers come forward for our offering. Um, let's pray and just thank God for 
what he has done and what we saw demonstrated here through Advent. God, what a joy it is that you, as was prophesied, fulfilled that prophecy, the hope of Jesus Christ, our Savior. What an amazing thing it is to be your children, to, to be, um, to have our sins forgiven by a Savior. And Lord, um, we just give back to you humbly and with gratitude. We thank you so much, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
You know, often we, uh, we see the news and we get a lack of hope about our future, and then you see something like that, right? In that, yes. in that, that's awesome. Um, and now the reward for the middle schoolers and high schoolers is get out of here. You're no longer welcome here, so that, that's your reward. And as I leave, I, w- I want to pray a blessing over them and their entire generation. God, we are blown away when we see young people who choose to follow you, who are passionate about you, the future of your church to carry on that more would know this beauty of what we, what we celebrate now with Christmas, that they would know the grace available, the mercy available for the covering of their sin, the grace, the unmerited favor to be drawn into relationship with you and have eternal life. Thank you for this youth. God, I pray for clarity of mind in such a difficult time. God, it is amazing what they have to deal with today. And yet you are right there with them. Holy Spirit, guide them in a powerful way and let them continue to be a powerful force for your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Merry Christmas, you all. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you on this third Sunday in Advent. I'm Becky Garner. My usual gig is on Tuesday mornings as one of the teachers of Oasis Women's Bible Study. And I'm also a new member of your council. But this morning, I have the joy of talking with you about the gift that keeps on giving. This is a part of our Advent series that we began two weeks ago called Big Present Christmas. So far, we've unwrapped two big presents, freedom and family. This morning, we're gonna unwrap a third. But before we get into it, does anybody remember that slogan, the gift that keeps on giving? It's actually 100 years old. And no, I wasn't around when it first came out. (laughs) I found out that it can be traced back to the 1920s to a Victor radio campaign ad. And then Hot Point kind of stole that slogan. And in 1928, during the Christmas season, they used that same slogan. Give mother what she really wants this season. This all white, Hot Point Electric Range. (laughs) A gift that keeps on giving. Wow, things have changed in 100 years, right? (laughs) This slogan has been used throughout the decades for gifts like RCA color TVs, Godiva chocolate, um, and even Kodak film. But I think that the ultimate gift that keeps on giving is our third big Christmas present of power that we receive with the gift of the Holy Spirit. So settle in, because this gift is so big, I'm going to need at least until February to unwrap this gift. And you thought you were going to make it to brunch, right? Okay. So uh, seriously, this is such a big gift that we will continue to unwrap it our entire lives. Before we unwrap the gift of the Holy Spirit, we need to figure out who this gift is from. Our key verse of Galatians 4, 6 says, because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. This verse could be the gift tag attached to the gift of the Holy Spirit. God the Father sent the Holy Spirit, who's the Spirit of his Son, Jesus. The gift of the Holy Spirit was not only sent from the Father, Jesus also promised the gift of the Holy Spirit in John 16, 7. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So the Holy Spirit, he's a joint gift from God the Father and God the Son. John 16, 7 reveals two more important truths about the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
First, we see that Jesus leaving his disciples after his death and his resurrection made it possible for the Holy Spirit to come to them. After Jesus ascended into heaven, he didn't leave his disciples just to fend for themselves. He sent the Holy Spirit as their advocate. The English word advocate has been translated from the Greek word parakletos, which means helper, advisor, and counselor. Next, we notice that Jesus said, I will send him to you. Jesus was acknowledging that the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not an inanimate energy. He's not an impersonal force. The Holy Spirit is a person with a mind, emotions, and a will in the same way that God the Father and God the Son are persons with personalities. A.W. Tozer said, you can know what the Spirit's like by knowing what Jesus is like, for he is the Spirit of the Father and the Son. Theologians refer to this relationship between these three persons united in one divine being as the Holy Trinity. Christianity, it's not a polytheistic or a multi-God faith. We believe in one God who exists as three eternal persons. This is mind-blowing stuff. Because when we think of a human being, we think of a single individual person, right? I'm an individual person, you're an individual person. So it's really hard to grasp how God can be one divine being consisting of three distinct persons. It's even more mind-blowing to hear from the lips of Jesus and from Paul's teaching in our Galatians passage today that one of the eternal divine persons of the Holy Trinity, God the Holy Spirit, he dwells in every single Christian heart. I'll never forget what a good friend and mentor said about the gift of the Holy Spirit to every new believer. She said, we don't get part of the Holy Spirit. We don't get a junior sized Holy Spirit. As believers in Jesus Christ, we get the entire Holy Spirit. We receive one of the eternal, divine persons of the Trinity when the Spirit of Christ enters our hearts. God the Father transforms us into the image of his Son through that indwelling of the Holy Spirit. May this truth sink deep into our hearts. The gift of the Holy Spirit is God himself dwelling in us. So, what is our experience as people who have received this big present of the Holy Spirit? God's people experience the transformative power of the Holy Spirit. This is the same power that transformed Jesus' terrified, disillusioned disciples hiding in an upper room after his death into dynamic, passionate evangelists who gave their lives to share the gospel. This is the same power that transformed a murderous Christian persecuting Pharisee named Saul into the great Apostle Paul, who is considered by many to be the most influential person after Jesus in the spread of Christianity. This is the same power that transformed me. When mere words from a book that I'd heard all my life became life and set my heart and my mind on fire with the beauty of the gospel of Jesus and the glory of who he is. Listen to what happens to every person when they first experience that transformative power of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5 says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transpasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. 
the Spirit's transformative power takes us from being spiritually dead in our sins to alive in Christ. We didn't transform ourselves so that God would save us. We couldn't transform ourselves. We needed the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit to make us alive in Christ. Listen to this. Romans 8:11 says, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Amen. Wow! I mean, wow! Titus 3, 4, and 6 describes how the Holy Spirit transforms us at salvation like this. But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus our Savior. The kind of transformation we experience at salvation is what Jesus called being born again in John 3. He told a seeker named Nicodemus that spirit gives birth to spirit and that to be born again meant to be born of the spirit. In Titus 3, Paul delivers the believer's born again transformation like this. It's the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. None of our works are clean enough or holy enough or righteous enough to save us. We're not the source of regenerative power that can birth new life from spiritually dead people. Only God by the Holy Spirit has the transformative power to make us absolutely new creations in Christ. Second Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Titus 3 also gives us a glimpse into the heart and the motivation of Jesus. He sent the Holy Spirit out of his goodness, his loving kindness, and his mercy. So now let's see what our new creation transformed life looks like in our Advent passage, Galatians 4, 4 through 7. You can follow along in your outlines or you can see it up on the screen. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship, because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. The recipients of the gift of the Holy Spirit are those who are God's adopted children. Last week, Pastor Dan reminded us that we're now sharing this identity as brothers and sisters in the family of believers and the household of God. Now, if you're a woman or a girl, they've all left, but maybe you're online, <laughs> uh, listening to this right now, maybe you're wondering why we as females should be excited about the adoption to sonship. And perhaps you're wondering why verse six doesn't say, because your sons and daughters, God sent the spirit. This is so interesting. The Greek word for adoption to sonship is actually a legal term, referring to the full legal standing of an adopted male heir in Roman culture. The apostle Paul wrote Galatians at a time in history when sons in the family were highly prized over daughters, both by Jewish culture and by the society at large. So when Paul tells both men and women that everyone in Christ has the equal status of adopted sons of God, people in that day would not have seen this as a slight against women. 
Rather, they would have seen this as God legitimizing, legitimizing, legitimizing. You know what I mean, right? Making it legal. And elevating all daughters in Christ to the same honor, same blessing, same power as male heirs. Now all of them joint heirs with Christ. I'm going to read verses 4 and 5, or 5 and 6, in the Amplified Version to help us see this concept of sonship for all God's children. I think it's going to be on the screen. So that he might redeem and liberate those who were under the law, and that we who believe might be adopted as sons, as God's children, with all rights as fully grown members of his family. And because you really are his sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. The reason why it's important to establish the sonship status of all believers is because God only sends the spirit of his son into his redeemed, adopted children. Verse 6 tells us it is because we have this honored status as God's children that he sends the Holy Spirit into our hearts. Well, one of the first things we can experience because of the gift of the Holy Spirit is the honor of being God's child. Galatians 4, 6 tells us what the Holy Spirit does when he arrives in the heart of a new believer. He cries out, Abba, Father, Why would the Holy Spirit do that? A very similar cry of the Spirit is found in Romans 8, 14 through 16. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, we cry. Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So why does the Holy Spirit cry, Abba, Father, in the heart of a believer? The Holy Spirit is testifying with our spirit that we are God's children. When a person testifies in a court of law, they're giving what? Evidence and proof. That's what the Spirit's doing when he testifies or he bears witness to our spirits. He's giving us this internal evidence that we are God's children. One way that the Holy Spirit gives us this internal evidence is by producing spiritual fruit, his spiritual fruit in us. I'm sure you know this from Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Yes, yes. This fruit is the evidence of us being led by the Spirit and that we are truly God's children. It's good for us to pause and ask ourselves, do we see evidence of the Spirit producing His fruit in our lives. And it's good for us as a church to ask ourselves, is there a bumper crop, a fruit of the Spirit overflowing from our community here at Hillside into the world? Another way that the Holy Spirit gives us this internal proof that we're God's children is that he teaches us and he empowers us to cry out to the Father in humility and submission. When we cry out, Abba, Father, in trust and dependence upon the Father, this is evidence that the Holy Spirit's actually working in us. Left to ourselves, apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, we're prone to place our trust in who? Ourselves. And to live as spiritual orphans. 
Luke 19.10 tells us that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. But did you ever think of Jesus' mission as saving spiritual orphans? John 14, 16, 18 is Jesus' rescue plan for spiritual orphans. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. How does Jesus fulfill his promise to never leave us as spiritual orphans? He sends us the Holy Spirit. He calls him the Spirit of Truth. And he's going to be with us forever. And the Spirit he doesn't just live with us, he lives in us. We take him with us wherever we go. Are we living into our true identity as God's beloved children who have the Holy Spirit living in us? Or are we still living as spiritual orphans? Listen to some of the characteristics of orphans. Orphans don't know where their next meal is coming from. They're always anxious about whether their needs will be met. When we're anxious and worried about our everyday needs like spiritual orphans, the Holy Spirit reminds us of Jesus' words from the Sermon on the Mount. He said, don't worry about your lives or what you eat or what you drink because we have a heavenly father who knows what we need. Orphans, they don't know much about their true identities and they don't know to whom they belong. When we feel like spiritual orphans who don't belong anywhere, the spirit reminds us of the truth of Ephesians 2, 13 through 15. But now you belong to Christ Jesus. At one time, you were far away from God. Now, you've been brought close to him. Orphans, they have no one to cherish or treasure them. They long to experience unconditional love and the joy of a parent. When we feel like spiritual orphans who feel unlovable or maybe even worthless, the Spirit whispers these words of Jesus from the Gospel of John. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. What did Jesus say? He no longer calls us his servants. He calls us his friends. Orphans lack a family to lean on and to ask for help or for comfort. They see themselves as lonely and alone, left to provide for themselves just to survive in the world. As you and I leave our orphan life behind, the Holy Spirit calls us deeper into the spiritual family we have with each other, that we have with other believers, that we have in our spiritual family. Romans 12, 5 says this, So in Christ, though we are many, form one body. Each member belongs to the others. We're no longer spiritual orphans. We belong to God, and we belong to one another in the body of Christ. Jesus made sure that the orphan life would not be the experience of us as redeemed people. In fact, Jesus guaranteed it. With the gift of the Holy Spirit, in 2 Corinthians 1, 21 through 22, it says, And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has put his seal on us, given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. 
You see, we have something so much better than adoption papers into God's family. We have God's seal stamped on our lives with the blood of Jesus Christ, who redeemed us by his death and adopted us into God's family. And we have God's guarantee of the Holy Spirit poured into our hearts. It's deposited there, confirming our adoption and certifying the promised privileges that we have, that we can enjoy as God's children. The Spirit of Truth is always testifying. You are God's beloved people and everything he has promised you is yes and amen in Jesus Christ. One of our greatest privileges as children of God is that we can call him Abba, Father. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he taught them to address God as our Father. This was unheard of in that day. There's no evidence in ancient Jewish literature or ancient Jewish liturgy of a Jewish person ever addressing God as Father. It was Jesus who introduced and modeled this radical and scandalous idea of addressing God directly as Father as we pray. As believers, we all have the right to call God our Father because of Jesus' death on the cross that accomplished our redemption and our adoption. Amen. So what does it even mean to call God our Abba Father? Aramaic was Jesus' native language. Abba is Aramaic for Father. It's been suggested that Abba can be translated Daddy. But in Jesus' day, Abba was used by children and adults alike to mean father. The word Abba only occurs three times in the New Testament. We've already seen two of them in Galatians and in Romans. But the very first occurrence of Abba is found in Mark 14, 36. It's when Jesus cries out to God in the Garden of Gethsemane before he would be crucified. He said, Abba, Father, Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Here, Jesus' use of Abba reveals his very intimate relationship with his Father, but it also reveals a very deep respect and submission to the Father's will. By following Jesus' example of addressing God as Abba, Father, we're enjoying that intimacy of children to our Heavenly Father, but we're also respecting His authority in our lives. When we join with the Spirit in crying out to God, Abba, Father, we're not only affirming that we belong to Him, but think of it this way, we're also affirming God the Father and bringing Him honor and joy. I know an adoptive dad who received so much joy when the boy that he adopted finally called him dad. Surely our Heavenly Father feels this kind of joy when we follow Jesus' example and we join with the Holy Spirit and we pray to him as Abba. This Christmas, we are reminded of just how much Jesus was such a gift and shows how God loves us and desires to be in relationship with us. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, the long-awaited Emmanuel, whose name means God with us, to die on a cross, to take away our sins so that we could be with him forever. And this Christmas, we also get to celebrate that God sent his Holy Spirit to live inside of us, to live in us so could, he could always be with us. God gives us the greatest gift of his presence 
through the birth of his son, and now through the gift of his Holy Spirit. God's big Christmas present is his presence. Brothers and sisters, as you continue to unwrap the big present of the power of the Holy Spirit in the coming days, let me leave you with Jesus' promise from Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Hillside, what will we do with the gift of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us with divine, transformative power? What will God do through us? In the transformative power of the Holy Spirit, let's go to the ends of our neighborhood streets. Invite them to the children's fair. Invite them to Christmas Eve. Let's go to the ends of our hallways at work and at school. Let's reach out to people who are struggling and where this time of year is really difficult. And together, let's go to the ends of the earth. Let's go to the ends of the earth, bearing witness to Jesus, who is our Savior, born at Christmas, died on a cross, is now risen and is reigning and it is indwelling in us, in me and in all of you by his Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay. I love my wife, but she literally just picked up all the music I had and messed it up for me. So I get... I get to demonstrate forgiveness. <laughs> which I'll be asking for later. Okay, here we go. <laughs> and I want, then I want Tom to just come up and give us a few words. May you experience the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and his divine, transformative power living in you. May he ignite and electrify our mission to be light in the world, empowering us to display the love of Jesus and to bring his kingdom to the world. Stay here. So our sister just presented the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
with power and authority. And whenever his word goes out, you have an opportunity to respond. And so I'm going to ask every head to be bowed right here and now. And if the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of truth, which is the spirit of love, is convicting you in your heart, and you want to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in Christ alone, I'm just going to ask it. And if you're feeling that spirit, that's the prompting of love, calling you into right relationship with his son through the Holy Spirit. And if that's you, I would just ask you to just raise your hand so that we might pray for you. And if you desire to get back in the right relationship, if you are feeling dry, or if you just want more of the love of Christ to break through the lies, and you want that adoption fully in the Christ Jesus, he is not a liar. And he is here today to set the captives free. So I just want to receive it. And I want to ask it that you would come and receive prayer. We are for you. We are a family. We love you because our Father loved us first. In Jesus' name. So I'm going to pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you that he's here right now and that he's convicting us and drawing us closer to you and in right relationship with you. And Lord, if there's anyone that is just so sick of the sin that they find themselves in, or really want to just draw us near, Lord, that you would draw them up, that they would receive the gift of adoption, and that you would kill the lie. Set us free, because that's what you came to do, in the mighty name of Jesus. And if there's anyone, just come forward and receive the grace that is given to you on this day, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, that our sister so eloquently spoken through the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.